All right, my objective this week was the treatment of pheochromocytoma, and you'll see up here that I put PPGL, which uh, stands for pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, and that is how it's actually named in the clinical practice guidelines of the Endocrine Society written in 2014. And it's because of a lot of the overlap, the significant overlap between a pheochromocytoma and a paraganglioma. In my opinion, this overlap is like the overlap between diarrhea and bulk stool. They both stink and they're often brown, but they are clinically two different things. Now you'll remember that if somebody has taken a sympathomimetic, let's say cocaine, for example, someone has taken a sympathomimetic, you cannot give them a beta blocker alone. This is called unopposed alpha stimulation, and this is the basis for how you treat pheochromocytoma. So unopposed alpha stimulation, remember that the alpha 1 and the beta 1 will increase the blood pressure. The alpha 2 and the beta 2 will cause a relative decrease in blood pressure. Now it would seem like if I knock this out and this out, I have balanced myself out, but that's not the case. The reason for this has to do with Starling's Law. First of all, alpha stimulation is always going to increase uh, the blood pressure. It's always going to cause vasocontraction and cause increased blood pressure. On the other hand, if I knock out this one, I don't have a vasodilation. So this is, knocking this out is always going to cause an increase in blood pressure because I don't get the dilation. Now, what, does alpha, what would it do if I blocked the beta-1 in this situation? If I did that, I decrease inotropy and chronotropy, right? So if I look at my preload and I look at the, the cardiac output or the stroke volume, there's a starling curve that, that shows basically a linear relationship up to a certain point that as I increase the preload, the more is going to put, be put out. Now, whenever you give a beta blocker, the, the, that is how um, it decreases the blood pressure as it adjusts this starling curve. And so now I have a curve that comes down here. So a given preload, I'm going to have less output. But you'll remember now, I'm, not, I'm talking about the preload. And so what determines the preload? Well, there are a couple of things. Venous return is one important thing, and afterload is another important thing. Ultimately, I can superimpose on here a venous return curve. And then when I have vasoconstriction, I'm going to shift that venous return curve. And so I went from a, a total cardiac output right here to a total cardiac output right here. And you'll see that that did not decrease it very much. And this is the effect that I get by blocking my beta-2 receptors. So blocking the beta-2 receptors is going to cause a shift in the venous return, which is going to stop any useful effect of the beta-1 blockade, and it's also going to now no longer have any opposition against the alpha receptors, and so your, your blood pressure could theoretically skyrocket. Okay, so going over everything in the notes, we have talked about autonomic control of the eye, we've talked about autonomic control of the bladder and of the colon, and now we have also covered unopposed alpha activation, and I've re-explained it here. In essence, beta-2 activation balances alpha activation. So if I get rid of beta-2 activation, I no longer have uh, any balancing force on the alpha activation, which is going to cause an increase in blood pressure. Blocking the beta-1 activation does not have any real effect on that hypertension, and that is because the venous return curves are altered. Okay, so that gets us into the alpha blockers. Phenoxybenzamine is an irreversible, non-selective alpha blocker, so it'll block alpha-1 and alpha-2. Basically what this means is it takes about a day for your body to replace uh, a, a, an alpha receptor. So if you block that irreversibly, then you have completely shut it off for the entire day. The goal of, of, of the alpha blockade in pheochromocytoma is that you get the, the, the drug levels up high enough that every alpha receptor is basically shut down for the duration of a surgery. 
There's another alpha blocker, phentolamine. It can uh, possibly be used in place of phenoxybenzamine. And then there are the selective alpha-1. These are selective alpha-1 uh, blockers, and they end in azacin, so prazacin, for example. And the way I remember these is the A stands for alpha, the Z means nothing, alpha-1 selective inhibitor. And I decided to go ahead and write that out for you. Okay, so we all knew that we needed to give phenoxybenzamine for about seven days. After the alpha blockade had taken full effect, start giving beta blockers propranolol. We all knew that, and we knew that it needed to continue the treatment for up to 10 to 14 days before the surgery. And so we have all of that covered uh, for the most part. But what I need to point out is, okay, first of all, we, we got it right. We, we did exactly what the Endocrine Society clinical practice guidelines say to do. The Endocrine Society in 2014 issued their clinical practice guidelines on how to treat pheochromocytoma. Now, due to three different things, these clinical practice guidelines might not have to be your one and only. For example, there are side effects, there are costs, and there is time. So it can take up to 14 days before you can are able to get a surgery with this. What can happen in 14 days? Well, a lot can happen. I mean, potentially even, statistically small, but potentially you could even get a metastasis in that time frame. Now, I explained to you that alpha-1 causes sphincter contraction, and so it makes sense that you would get a retrograde ejaculation. This is one of the, when the, you see those wild things that just are, pop out at you, that's what this is. And then the more common things, orthostasis, nasal dripping, and stuffiness. And I'm not saying that the retrograde ejaculation is not common. I don't know how common it is, it just popped out at me. The prices of some of these medications have also been in flux. So phenoxybenzamine, and then we're going to talk about uh, metyrazine in a minute as well. Those prices have been changing quite drastically uh, recently. So your other options are you can use nifedipine, which is a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. And you'll remember that this can block calcium channels and cause vasodilation. Uh, it is not a... And so the non-dihydropyridines will also have a cardiac impact, but the recommendations don't say to use those, verapamil and diltiazem. It says to use the nifedipine dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. So whenever you're using this as monotherapy, you can still have cardiac increased contractility, inotropy, chronotropy, which actually may be helpful if you have a cardiomyopathy like we did in our case. So the catecholamines have caused the dilated cardiomyopathy, and so you can keep your, your uh, cardiac output up in situations where um, you wouldn't be able to if you were using a beta blocker. This is not without significant side effects, but the morbidity and mortality overall has been about the same as the standard treatment. Another option is instead of using phenoxybenzamine, you can use the alpha-1 uh, selective drugs, and in those cases you can use them in two ways. You can use them as your primary pharmaceutical, whereas you would not use phenoxybenzamine, or you can use them with phenoxybenzamine while you're, you're loading up, and when you have those paroxysms of hypertension during that loading phase, that, that 7 to 10 day phase, you would add an alpha-1 selective to deal with those paroxysms. Metyrosine is the third option, and the reason we have this option is because it's a lot faster. The Mayo Clinic has been using this, and they can get to surgery within about five days. So let's talk really quick about how metyrosine works. To make the catecholamines, what you're actually going to do is you're going to use uh, convert tyrosine into dopa. That's with tyrosine hydroxylase using tetrahydrobiopterate, converting it into dihydrobiopterate. Then from DOPA, you go uh, to dopamine, that requires DOPA decarboxylase. And from dopamine, you go to norepinephrine. This is a vitamin C dependent process, and it uh, uses the enzyme dopamine beta hydroxylase. Now, vitamin C is important because it, the only other place you're going to really see this in biochemistry is in collagen production. Now, from norepinephrine, you're going to produce epinephrine, and that, is a, that requires PNMT. That stands for phenylethanolamine in methyltransferase. Sometimes it's called norepinephrine in methyltransferase. The thing that's important about PNMT is that it is a cortisol-dependent 
enzyme. That means whenever cortisol is present, the expression of this enzyme gets upregulated. So that is why it's so important for the adrenal medulla to be in close proximity to the adrenal cortex. Biochemically important is that this process requires s methionine. It takes a methyl group from s methionine and converts that into homocysteine, making epinephrine. Okay, so what does all this have to do with metyrazine? Metyrazine actually blocks DOPA decarboxylase. So if you administer metyrazine in the right concentration, you can actually prevent almost all epinephrine and norepinephrine from being produced in the adrenal medulla especially, but you have to be uh, careful. This will also prevent norepinephrine from being produced everywhere in the body. So it's not without consequences. But again, the major benefit is that you can reduce the wait time down to five days. Now we've said that there are three options for treating a pheochromocytoma preoperatively and the major option recommended by the Endocrine Society is to administer phenoxybenzamine for seven days and then for the next three to seven days administer phenoxybenzamine with propranolol. Now we have to talk about the non-pharmaceutical preoperative treatment. During catecholamine excess, you get increased blood pressure through three mechanisms. The first and foremost is your alpha-1 is going to cause vasoconstriction, and that's going to increase blood pressure. The second is you're going to get your beta-1 that's going to give you inotropy and chronotropy on your uh, cardiac myocytes. The third one is also a beta-1, and that is the beta-1 induction of renin release, at the uh, kidney, and so that renin release activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, causing increased blood pressure. All of that increased blood pressure is going to have a reflex. The first reflex is the increase of atrial natriuretic peptide, and the second reflex is to downregulate antidiuretic hormone. Altogether, with these two mechanisms, you get a constant decrease in your body water. It's called catecholamine volume contraction. So as soon as you start giving the alpha inhibitors, you want to also start a high salt, high water diet. You want to get as much volume repletion, restore all the lost volume before the day of surgery because the second you take that tumor out and there is no longer a secretion of catecholamines in the bloodstream, the, the blood pressure is going to plummet. And if you don't have the volume restored, you will not be able to restore it rapidly enough with bolus infusion. Intraoperatively, as you're touching and pressing on the tumor, it's going to secrete excessive amounts of catecholamine because it's being agitated, it's being handled, and you want to be able to lower the blood pressure during the operation. And what you're going to use for that is nitroprusside. Nitroprusside, whenever it gets metabolized, it releases NO and it also releases cyanide. The NO primarily is what it's useful for to cause vasodilation. I've written here post-operative management. Now let me explain what I mean by that. After you take the tumor out, you're still in operation, but after that tumor comes out, you have a whole new set of risks. It's no longer hypertension, it's hypotension that you have to deal with. So even though it says post-operative, this is at the end of the operation and all the way up through post-operative. And what you do is you replace volume as fast as you can to treat the hypotension. The other thing that the textbooks and everything say that you can use is vasopressin, which is also called uh, antidiuretic hormone. But you give vasopressin, it's going to cause vasoconstriction. Now the next part of this has to understand exactly what you're going to do in the operation. What are you going to take out? If you are doing a unilateral uh, removal, then you're going to take one adrenal gland. You're going to take the whole thing. You don't take the adrenal medulla. You take the entire adrenal gland. In the case where you have bilateral pheochromocytoma, you're going to take both adrenal glands completely. That's going to lose the adrenal cortex's ability to produce cortisol and aldosterone. Even in unilateral removal, you're going to have a loss of total glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids, and so you need to evaluate does there need to be a replacement in these steroids? And, and so you go from there, and, and that's why I've written here that you uh, can replace corticosteroids and mineralocorticoids. 
Malignancy and metastases. Okay, so if you can't remove all of it, the primary goal in treatment is to remove the entire tumor surgically. When that's not completely possible, decarbazine, cyclophosphamide, and vincristine, these are the traditional regimen of chemotherapy. Your other option for chemotherapy is sinatinib, thalidomide, and timozolamide. 